Okay, we are recording and we'll move right along. So Amy's gonna kick off with what extension is. Yeah, so um, you know, we think that extension is one of those best kept secrets, um, but we are here, we're out and about in your community and we really are that spot where the university meets the community. Um, each university or each state across the US has what's called a land grant university um, set forth by Congress a long time ago to achieve a certain mission. And that's basically education, research and outreach. And we are the outreach arm of Colorado State University, Azure Land Grant University. And so, you know, we offer a lot of different programs. We offer things like the program you're here today for, which is a nice horticulture program. We also have volunteer programs like the Master Gardener program, 4-H program. Um, we teach across lots of different areas, maybe food safety, natural resources, agriculture, entomology, tons and tons of stuff that agents across the state are doing um, for you guys and for your community. So you can learn more about CSU Extension at the website there, extension.colostate.edu. That's also where you can go to find tons of resources like fact sheets and links to other things like Plant Talk and Grow and Give, and we're gonna talk about some of those today. All right, so this is funny, cause like I you know, just pop in, we're gonna be like moving heads back for you, yeah. <laughs> so today what we're gonna talk about are, I'm gonna start off with some lawn questions, and I noticed no one in the chat said that their lawn was amazing, but I bet there were some really nice lawns out there. I would say that that was one of my crowning jewels of the season, was having some good success with lawn. Uh, we'll move into tree issues and Amy and I are going to go back and forth on some of the common tree issues that we had and then Amy will wrap us up with some vegetables as well, which a lot of you had great success with and small fruits as well. So moving into the lawn review for 2021, I hope you look at this picture and it kind of makes you slap your head in disgust. This was actually a photo that we took at the courthouse here in Larimer County. Uh, what had happened is that they actually sodded over these sprinklers. Uh, so they sodded over it. They didn't actually cut a hole for the sprinklers at the time. It was adjusted. Don't worry, but this is obviously a pretty major lawn issue. The first topic I want to really address is clover lawns. So hashtag trending. Obviously, I know a lot of you have probably heard quite a bit about clover lawns, or you've probably read about it. Maybe it was in one of your publications that you get. And so uh, as such, we got a lot of questions both in our offices and personally about clover lawns. And it is a really kind of trendy subject. If you've ever been to the United Kingdom, you know that a lot of their lawns already have clover in it. So it's kind of funny that it's having this resurgence in the United States. But let's talk a little bit about clover. So clover obviously is a legume. It is a, a dicot plant. So it is different from our grasses because our grasses are monocot. Uh, the pros of having clover is that it is viewed as potentially more ecological and sustainable. The huge benefit of clover is because it is a legume, it's able to fix its own nitrogen. So basically, if you have a clover lawn, you'll never in theory need to apply any fertilizer because it takes um, atmospheric nitrogen out of the air and then does this really fancy chemical process and then is able to essentially provide food to itself. Uh, the nice thing about clover is that in terms of a weed, if you view clover as a weed, it's actually really attractive. So it has these amazing white flowers that are incredibly beneficial to our pollinators. And so if that's a goal in your life is to really have more of a pollinator friendly landscape, then having clover in your lawn is a great way to do that. So uh, they are a good source of pollen, um, not just for honeybees, but for other pollinators as well. And it does tend to be really cold hardy. So here in Colorado, that's important. Uh, as we get into more of the winter months, if you haven't lived here very long, you'll know that you'll come to realize, and those of you who have lived here will come to realize that we have a lot of winter where we're exposed. So we don't have regular snow cover, at least not on the front range. And some of those other ground covers or alternate turf types can really get winter kill. So I'm thinking specifically of creeping time. If you have creeping time between your pathways and pavers, usually you'll have some, some dead come spring. So clover is a really good winter hardy plant. The cons of clover is that you may think of it as a weed. Uh, so it's funny because I was just having this conversation with some of my colleagues 
and I was saying I was going to talk about clover and one of them immediately said, oh, but that's a weed. So it really does depend on how you view it. Um, it's not potentially as traffic tolerant if you have a clover lawn versus a traditional bluegrass or tall fescue lawn. So if you do have a lot of play or you have big dogs that tend to tear up the lawn, the recovery time can be a little bit slower and you might actually get some bare spots. So that is one thing is consider the use of the turf. It also needs fairly regular irrigation. So it's not a truly drought tolerant plant. And so you will still need to supplementally water, especially if the area is getting traffic. That is how the plant is going to be able to recover is by having some regular irrigation. So approximate of a half inch to one inch of water a week uh, all through the summer. And so just know that it does need regular irrigation. It does also do best in full sun. So if you have really shady spots, it's not going to be as successful. And then if you do get weeds like bindweed or plantain in this case, weed control is difficult because clover is a dicot, which I mentioned as our plantain, as is bindweed. And so your choice of chemicals becomes very limited uh, if you do have to do weed control on other plants. So just take all of that in mind. If you're sold on the clover idea, when we send out the recording of this presentation, we will have a, a publication included that you can utilize. Uh, just know that you're going to seed about a pound of clover into a thousand square feet. The process would be the same where you aerate heavily, lots and lots and lots of holes, and then use a fertilizer spreader to put out the seed, work the seed into the holes and water to get it established. Um, there's a couple of different species you can get. Cipollina is a micro clover, which means it just has smaller, tinier leaves, uh, very expensive, $30 a pound. So that is an investment if you have a 2,000 to 3,000 square foot lawn, or you can just get Dutch white clover of five to $8 a pound. So it's around, you can buy it online and also get it from seed companies. Moving into sustainable lawn care. So one of the big things that people are really looking at are doing lawn conversion. So taking a typical bluegrass lawn and maybe converting it to something else, potentially buffalo grass, blue grandma. I would throw clover lawns into there. The thing is, is if you decide to do this, your existing trees, this is so important. And I think something that might get overlooked during the renovation process, your existing mature trees will need water, okay? So if you have linden or ash or any other trees that have been used to growing in a bluegrass lawn that has received regular irrigation for their lifetime, when you do these conversions, because then your buffalo grass, your blue grandma lawn would need less water, you still need to provide water to these trees. That is number one, because trees are such an investment. They take a really long time to get mature. And so don't neglect those tall things above your head. Make sure that you are giving them regular water. The other tip I'll give you is that the most successful conversions are going to have to use the use of herbicides. Doing this approach organically is really going to result in a lot of frustration. Um, the other thing is that the herbicides that are generally used to control seedling weeds and to make sure that they're safe for your seedling turf of different species, they're going to be different. They may be very new to your landscape contractors. They might not be familiar, but this is where extension can come in and really provide you some guidance on this. Um, so it can be done. You can absolutely take parts of your bluegrass lawn and convert it to buffalo grass. It needs to be the right site. That's number one, it needs to be in full sun. Um, and it does need to be done thoughtfully. So it's not just something that you can approach, but the next few months are a great time to consider how this could be done, the steps to take uh, and what you need to invest in. If you're just looking to reduce your lawn water use, maybe you got a bill over the summer and you're like, oh my goodness, that's expensive. Uh, one easy tip, this is so easy, to save 10% of your water next year, reduce the run times of your irrigation by 10%. This doesn't mean that you are stopping days of watering. It's just taking your total run time for a cycle. Let's say it's 30 minutes and you're reducing it by 10%. So you are dropping it three minutes. And so you'll run that cycle for 27 minutes. I would hazard a guess that you will not notice the difference. Your neighbors won't notice the difference, but your water bill will be definitely less. 
Uh, you can keep pushing it. You can maybe do 15%, maybe even 20% and see how far it can go until the lawn isn't of a quality that you want. But that's a really easy tip. My other suggestion, definitely try to run your clocks on a manual operation, which means you turn the clock on and off instead of setting it in the spring and letting it run all season. So this means that if it's going to rain or we have some sort of dissipation event, you will actually go and turn off your clock or invest in technology like rain sensors, wind sensors, soil moisture sensors. There's a lot of great technology out there that can help you be more efficient with your water use. And finally, look at your irrigation heads. And so I have three different types listed here. The one on the left are the pop-up sprays. Those are considered to be the least efficient. Uh, if you have those in your landscape, you know that you run them and they pour out water and you will get runoff very, very quickly. Moving to the right, those are called stream rotors and they look like fingers of water, and they are considered to be the most efficient. Looking at the run times, you might only have to run pop-up sprays for a few minutes before the ground can't take the water and it starts to run off, but those rotor type, the heads that actually move back and forth, they need to run a lot longer. Um, it doesn't mean you're putting out more water, it's just they put out water so much more slowly that they need to run for a longer period of time. So the stream rotors are the most efficient. They have a larger droplet size, which actually hits the surface of the turf. It doesn't necessarily just evaporate into the atmosphere, which is really important. Um, so consider investing in that kind of technology. Maybe pick a zone, switch out all of the heads in that zone. Don't mix and match these. That's not a good idea. Um, but you can do that over time and try to get more efficient landscape irrigation going forward. All right, our tree review is going to start with Miss Amy. All right, I'm, trying, I'm double duty here. I'm trying to do some chat as well as um, present. So Allison, you want to sneak around me and do yeah. the chat? We're going to do a little switcheroo here. All right, so let's review some of the tree issues that we saw in 2021. Um, I wanted to start out with, um, to me, probably one of the more uh, alarming issues that we saw in 2021, but I don't think that you all should be as alarmed as maybe the newspapers are telling you. Um, EAB, Emerald Ash Borer, was confirmed for the first time in Weld County in late June of 2021. Um, and, you know, yes, it's the first time it's in Weld County. However, um, as I'm gonna show you, and I think the next slide, Erie's proximity to the initial um, place where we found EAB is not that far. So it was it was expected. They've known about it for a long time. They've been preparing for it and they've been educating um, the residents of Erie for quite some time to get ready for this. Um, so back in late June 2021, um, I was called down to the town of Erie along with the Erie Town Forester, uh, representative from the Colorado State Forest Service, and um, a couple others. And together, we all kind of scouted around town a little bit to look at um, what we were, you know, what we were seeing. It was it EAB? They never actually found the host tree for this, um, but. What happened was they found the adult insect. Uh, someone called that lived pretty close to downtown in, in the downtown area and said, I found this on my picnic table. Can you tell me what it is? And, and they thought it was the AB. And, and lo and behold, yes, we did confirm that it was the AB. So some of the symptoms that you'll see with emerald ash borer are things like the thinning of the crown of the tree, like you see in the left-hand picture there. You also see, and this is one of the telltale signs that I learned about, is this tufting of small little growths of leaves. Um, it kind of looks like um, they're just, they're growing wild in this little ball. And so that's something else to look for. But what I had never seen before, which I think is really quite fascinating, is you could see the chewing of the edges of the leaf from those adult insects. That was really quite interesting. Here's another picture where you can see that chewing damage just like their mouth parts are just going in there and munching away on the edges of those leaves. Now we all, and I'll talk about this in a minute, that's not what kills the tree. That's not what harms the tree necessarily is that munching on the leaves. It actually goes back to the larval stage of this insect where they're boring into the wood. And I've got pictures to show you in a minute. So let's just do a little quick review of EAB. 
emerald ash borer. Um, here you can also see the insect itself. That is the guy that fell on the picnic table right there in my hand in that vial. And that was sent off for an exact confirmation, I should say. So in general, like I said, I want to review a little bit. Emerald ash borer is a green colored metallic beetle that feeds specifically on ash trees. And those are trees in the family Fraxinus. Um, it's a wood boring insect. It's a, a flat headed wood borer. Uh, and it, it goes in under the bark and starts to, uh, it lays its eggs and then those eggs turn to larval stage. And then those larvae kind of meander their way around underneath the bark and create problems. So I mentioned earlier that, you know, here in Erie, um, this was expected. This was kind of, they knew that it was coming. In fact, they kind of known that it's been in the area for a while. They've just never had that confirmation, that insect that they were able to pinpoint. Um, and so on this map here, this map is a little outdated. Um, we used to have a quarantine for emerald ash borer around the Boulder County area because that's where it was initially found. And so they quarantined off that area and basically, you weren't supposed to be moving ash wood um, anywhere outside of that quarantined area and really outside of the state um, a little bit later on. But inside of that same quarantine, they did include this little parcel of Wells County um, before it was confirmed there. because At the time, EAB wasn't there, but that's where the landfill is, where all of that wood from the dead trees in the Boulder area and the Longmont area, that's where they were taking all of that wood. And so they included that into the quarantine. So it's really a little bit more of a policy thing um, than a scientific thing at the time. But now we know that EAB, and again, expected, has just worked its way on over to Erie. For those of you that are, you know, say in the Greeley area or in you know, maybe Fort Lupton or Firestone, you guys are quite a ways away still from where we're finding Emerald Ash Borer. It's still pretty contained to this west of I-25, up and down this area, you know, kind of starting its way into North Denver uh, area, but really it's, it's still there. It's not quite out to you guys yet. So I'm going to talk a little bit about management, and I want you to think about that, that you are a little bit further away from the source here, and so maybe you don't need to quite be treating just yet. So let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, Oh, here's just some other pictures to show you what that insect looks like when its wings open up. It's a, quite a beautiful insect, very destructive. Um, and then that larval stage that meanders its way around the cambium of the tree and blocks the flow of water and nutrients. Over time, will kill the tree. This is a, a, uh, some pictures of what the holes look like where those insects bore into the wood because they're a flat-headed borer. They have a very distinct D shape to them, like a capital D, and they're fairly small. You'll find other holes in ash trees that are larger than the emerald ash borer holes. Those are typically from lilac ash borers, um, but uh, this is what we're seeing. And you can see all the meandering that those larvae do under the bark and how that can really disrupt the flow of nutrients and water. I should mention that essentially that entire tree will get girdled by that insect tunneling over time. And all trees, whether they're young or old, they're healthy or stressed, as long as they're an ash tree, a true ash tree, not a mountain ash, uh, but a, you know, a green ash, white ash, things like that, they're all susceptible. And so even your healthy trees down the road, when this gets to your area, are going to be susceptible. So I talked about management. Um, this is time for you all to be making decisions about your ash trees, whether you're, you're in the thick of it in the Boulder area or in the Loveland area or in the Fort Collins area where we're starting to see those things show up a little bit. Um, or if you're out in, like I said, further out east, Greeley, uh, Fort Lupton, places like that, now is the time to be making those decisions. So um, not all ash trees are going to be worth treating right away. As I mentioned, the further away from the source you are, the, you have more time to think about this. And there's a certain amount of damage that the tree can take um, from emerald ash borer where it can still recover uh, if, you, if you don't get to it right away or if you don't preventatively treat for it. So consider the health of your trees, consider the age of your trees. And then you're also going to have to ask yourself questions like, is my tree really worth the cost? 
that it's going to take down the road to treat for emerald ash borer because it can be a little bit pricey. Um, you know, but at the same time, if you've got a big, beautiful old ash tree that you want to save, it's well worth the money then to treat for that, um, that insect. So we have this thing called a, a management decision guide. We're going to send you guys a link to this um, after the class today. So you can look through that. And if you have an ash tree on your property, you can help. It'll help you make that decision of what should you be doing. Um, there's also a new, newer website where we're kind of housing all of this information about emerald ash borer. It used to be with the Colorado Department of Agriculture. But now we've moved that over to the Colorado State Forest Service website. And so you'll be looking for a website called Emerald Ash Borer, a green menace, and that is the truth, it is a green menace. Um, this is a little picture uh, of that website just to show you all the great information that they have. They also have that map updated to show you where Emerald Ash Borer has been confirmed. And then finally, when you're ready, if that decision takes you to treatment, CSU offers a great fact sheet written by Whitney Cranshaw um, just last year on uh, insecticides that you can use to control emerald ash borer on your residential shade trees. Now, typically you'll have to hire an arborist to administer a lot of these treatments, um, but that's all part of the decision process and it will walk you through that in that decision tree. So I'm gonna turn it over to Allison. She's gonna talk a little bit about aphids and how great of a year it was for the aphid. Great for the aphids, maybe not so great for your plants. So, Allison? Fun, we're doing like this round robin. So it was a good year for aphids. Uh, I use that as a, I don't know, you can look at it as a good year or uh, harmful to you. So aphid populations do really boom when we have a wet spring. So it seems like eons ago that spring happened. And if you do remember, it was really cold and wet for a lot of the spring. And so all that moisture really encouraged a lot of succulent new growth and aphids love to feast on succulent new growth. So the aphids that we saw early on were the ones that actually overwintered as eggs. So mama aphid lays her eggs in the winter. They over, uh, they, they hang out. And then when conditions are right, they actually hatch. Um, so those were the first generation of aphids that we do see. And this is really fascinating. I love the secret life of aphids. And it's, it's just interesting. So even though aphids are a nuisance, even though they cause, you know, the excretion and the honeydew and that they're really gross in some aspects, how they actually boom with their populations is fascinating. So almost all aphids are exclusively female. You would be really, really hard pressed to find a male in the bunch. So female aphids are what you're going to see. So that's fun fodder for you to share with your, your loved ones and friends later on today. And during the growing season, aphids give birth to live young. The live young are born pregnant. And so if you think about this, like if you think, wow, rabbits reproduce really fast, mice reproduce really fast, nope, aphids have them totally covered. So the mother aphid gives birth, the young, those guys are already born pregnant, and an aphid can actually give birth to 12 aphids every day, up to 80 a week. That's just one little aphid. So if you have you know, 50 aphids, you can see how those populations increase so quickly. What happens then when food kind of dries up or it runs out, the aphids, the female aphids, will actually then form wings. And so this is another adaptation that they have. So they can form wings and then start new colonies elsewhere. So it actually is a really interesting phenomena. Um, the honeydew, in case you're wondering if you've ever sat under a tree and you feel this kind of sticky stuff, or maybe you've parked under an elm and you have all this, the honeydew is the food waste that comes out of the aphid, so it's basically poo, uh, that then drips onto your car. We have another phenomena associated with honeydew called sooty mold, and that's kind of that black stuff. It looks almost like ashy black charcoal uh, that you begin to see. Um, other insects do also produce honeydew like scale and anything that's a piercing sucking insect. So aphids are one of those. But I love this picture. Aphids come in all colors. They come in green and yellow and black, obviously, and red. And so here's, you know, your friend, the aphid, giving birth to an aphid, which, of course, is born pregnant. 
What do you do? We talk about aphids a lot, but really the easiest thing, if it's possible, is just shoot them off with a strong jet of water. Uh, our entomologist, Whitney Cranshaw, actually is pretty hilarious when he talks about this. And people are always wondering, well, the aphids are going to find their way back. And they don't. Aphids don't have the capacity to know where they came from or how to get back to where they came from. So they'll be blasted off. They will land and they will do what they can to find another food source. But in a lot of cases, they just kind of wither and die. Uh, the other thing you can do is, of course, encourage our natural predators, such as lady beetles, which is right here. That's a larvae of a lady beetle. So it's the larvae that go to town on aphid populations. They love to munch. The adults don't eat nearly as much as the larvae do. And then green lacewings are another natural predator of aphids. And they have really cool egg structures that actually kind of hang pendulously below a leaf. So you could encourage natural predators. There's a lot out there. Um, you could try some insecticidal soaps if that's a route you want to go, or really just learn to accept them. For the most part, especially on shade trees, or if you have them in populations of your roses and things like that, they don't actually affect the plant growth. They look bad, you might freak out, but they don't actually affect the overall growth. So really think about if you need to control them. If there's an active population on your Brussels sprouts in your vegetable garden, obviously that's something you're starting to consume. That might be a place where you use a strong jet of water or other control. But leaf curl aphids and the, um, oh, I just blanked, the ones that are kind of fuzzy and white and cottony like the apple, aphid, yeah. woolly apple aphid, this is why Amy is here. Uh, those really don't affect uh, the growth of the tree at all. So don't worry too much about those. And Amy's back with Ips beetle. All right, a lot on over here. <laughs> All right, so, you know, this is, Ips beetle is one of these things that um, you probably aren't gonna see this as a homeowner or as a, a resident of your, your personal trees. It's really not something that we see very often at all. But um, this was quite a fascinating site visit that Allison and I went on together. And so we thought uh, we'd just kind of give you a little sneak peek of what we saw this year. Um, so Ips beetle, I'm just going to move my screen out of here. Um, so Ips beetle is one that I actually did come across last year during 2020 in the Greeley area. Um, and then this year we were called out by the town forester for the to look at the Berthoud Cemetery, which, which sits right on the Larimer Weld County line. And he was having trouble with several of their spruce trees dying from the top down very quickly. And when I say quick, I mean within a few weeks, just lots and lots of death happening. Um, ironically, this was all happening in a cemetery, which is a lot of other death happening there too, but this poses a lot of really difficult um, management decisions that had to be made because when you have trees growing in a space like this in a cemetery, you are really limited in your options. Um, one, there's no, there's no sprinkler system underground with pop-up heads everywhere watering the turf and watering the trees. Instead, they have some impact sprinklers set up here and there that will kind of overhead water the area, but they have to be very careful about, you know, stone peeving or watering too much. And so oftentimes these trees are stressed. Also their root systems are competing with other things. And so um, they're just, they're, they're in a tough spot. So um, let's talk about this a little bit more. I'm gonna go to the next slide here and show you some signs and symptoms of what you might see with this. Um, so Ips beetle is a small wood boring beetle um, bark beetle gets under the bark, travels around, munches on things, kind of similar to EAB, much smaller in size, um, but it causes the same kind of plugging up of the vascular system of the tree. And again, similar to EAB, you start to see that damage from the top down. One thing that you should, if you start to see this on, and, and this is typically on spruce and pine, I should mention that it's on your evergreen trees. And a lot of times we're seeing this mostly on those older mature trees that have been around for a long time that are in a stress situation. But as you look at those types of trees and that maybe suspect that this might be the problem, one thing to look for is this orange sawdust-like remnants that show up on the bark or on the ground near the trunk. And that's just, again, where that 
insect is boring in and then pushing that sawdust out. And for spruce, they tend to have that underneath that bark is very orange in color. So that's what gives it that orange color. So again, you'll see that top down dieback from the top um, and they're gonna be feeding underneath and they're gonna be causing all kinds of problems. But there, again, there's not many management options, especially in this situation um, where you were in the cemetery. Now the picture you see here in the middle, that was a tree in Greeley um, at a hospital. So kind of similar, it's a public space. You can't, can you imagine someone coming out with a big spray boom and trying to spray that tree and the, you know, you got a hospital right there, you've got a cemetery right there. It's just not something that you can do in a public space. So you have to resort to other options. And a lot of times that's tree removal. Here are some pictures from the Bertha visit. You can see Allison and the town forester, Josh, there um, inspecting that tree. They've marked this one for removal. They did end up having to remove several of these trees because it, it progresses so fast and they can produce a couple generations in a year. So it's not just a one and done life cycle. Um, so uh, what they ended up doing at the Berthoud Cemetery was, like I said, they removed a lot of trees. They made those hard decisions on the ones that were already showing severe decline from the top. The ones though that were left, and they have several, uh, several mature spruce and pine trees, they actually, uh, we talked to Whitney Cranshaw, we got some confirmation on this, and he actually recommended that they do a similar treatment to EAB and inject into the trunk emmectin benzoate, which is the chemical, um, it's triage that we recommend for EAB. So um, he said that'll work for these guys too. I don't know um, if that's something that we're always recommending, but in this particular situation, that's what happened. So Again, just an interesting situation um, and something that kind of made us do a lot of thinking. So I want to share that with you. So we're going to turn it back over to Allison to talk about fall color. A much happier subject. So obviously we had, fall color had a moment this fall. Uh, it's still absolutely beautiful. And I just wanted to touch on why the fall color was so phenomenal because I hope you all really appreciated it. Uh, it wasn't just in the mountains and it was in our own neighborhoods really great. When we come to the botany of leaves, I'm not going to get into this super heavy, but leaves are colored by molecules called pigments. Um, the green pigment in leaves is chlorophyll, and of course chlorophyll is produced by photosynthesis um, during the summer months. As the weather changes, as we get some cooler days, as the days start to shorten, the plant actually stops producing chlorophyll. Um, because it's really expensive for the plant to produce. Okay, so chlorophyll is expensive, but it also is what then essentially causes or really provides the food to the tree overall. Um, and then as the chlorophyll kind of depletes from the leaf, that's when you start to see other colors express themselves. And so this is again, more fun fodder for you. Um, all aphids are female and carotenoids uh, produce the yellow and orange pigmentation in leaves and then the anthocyanins are the red, purple or pink. And so here in Colorado, our most common colors that we see obviously are produced by the carotenoids, the, the, orange, and, the orange and yellow, aspens, cottonwoods, the anthocyanins, if you moved here from the Midwest or the East Coast, you are desperate for the sugar maples and some of those other tree species that really give us a beautiful show. Genetics are a huge part of how fall color happens. And really plant species, what kind of plant it is will determine if there is any fall color. So if you've ever taken a class from Amy or I and we talk about plant selection, we might say, wow, this Texas red oak has phenomenal red fall color. Or we might say the hackberry has kind of meh fall color. So the genetics of the tree really do have a factor in all of this. Those with famous yellow fall color, I just mentioned a couple of them. They also include the honey locust, which right now is, I think, in its prime. Our green ash has also beautiful yellow fall color. And then those with uh, red or orange are sugar maples, and then our autumn purple white ash. So all of those come into play. I would never recommend, as Amy said, to plant any ash at this time. But if you're looking for something with purple or red fall color, there might be some options that we can provide to you. Um, blah fall color, burr oaks, never that impressive. Norway maple, never that impressive. Uh, so it does go by a lot of species. 
the environmental conditions such as temperature also come into play. So this fall has been extremely long and leisurely. We've had some nights where we've dipped into the mid 20s, but last fall, if you remember, we had those crazy temperature crashes where it was 70 degrees one day and then in October we hit the teens. That does not bode well for fall color. So the fact that we've had a nice long leisurely fall is a really good thing. Um, those warm days, which we had well into October and cool nights, that crisp fall air is really what makes the best fall color. Um, and basically what happens is the cooler nights trap the sugar in the pigments, um, and then that intensifies the coloration of the leaf. Um, so temperature is a big thing and it's just been an ideal fall to have really good fall color. Day length, as you know, it gets dark crazy early. Um, and before the time change on Sunday, it was dark really late into the morning, making it tough to get out of bed. Uh, but day length also has a factor. So it's a natural signaling to the plants that the days are getting shorter and hay trees, it's time to drop your leaves. That's also a signal to produce less chlorophyll. So these trees have these environmental sensors that basically tell them the seasons are changing. It is time to consider dropping your leaves and going into the fall. And then moisture, and this is kind of the weird one because we had all that rain in the spring, but then for the most part had a very, very hot, dry summer in most parts of the Front Range in Colorado. So the best fall color displays are produced in areas that have adequately moist soil. If you have a shade tree that was in a lawn that received regular irrigation, that is going to be the moisture that it needs. Um, in other parts or maybe in the back 40 or in prairie areas, probably not a lot of irrigation. So the fall color was good, but it might not have been as good if we had those monsoon rains that we typically get during the summer months. Um, a warm fall can also decrease the intensity of fall colors. So we had just that perfect balance where we didn't have too many warm days. Um, and again, that natural sensing. So the leaves also this year seem to be forming their natural abscission layer, which is that basically where that leaf cuts off and falls off, which is a good thing because we've had too many years where the leaves have frozen on the trees and it kind of makes things look strange for a while. It doesn't hurt the tree. Um, but it is better when it forms that natural abscission layer because then all of those, um, the food sources can go back into the branches. So was it a good year? Yes. Uh, I did ask my master gardeners here in Larimer County to send me some of their favorite fall color picks and they did not disappoint. So um, just amazing fall color. Even the autumn blaze maples that weren't chlorotic had some beautiful red color. Uh, this year and the yellows were just so vibrant against a bright blue sky. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, one note going forward, it is still very, very dry. We might be getting some weather tomorrow. I wouldn't count on it. So do remember to do your fall and winter watering. It is absolutely essential. Keeping that soil profile moist is a good thing. So having adequately moist soil year round is ideal. Uh, water on days when it's above 40, today would have been a good day, and then do that as early in the day as possible. So if you can start watering in the morning and allow that water to soak in before it gets too cold and freezes at night is a good thing. Um, if there's snow or ice on the ground, skip that, but try to aim for once a month and try to give about an inch of irrigation. It's not exact science. There's a lot of unknowns about this, uh, but trees that do have adequate moisture year round do tend to have less insect issues, disease issues, and overall stress. Refer to fact sheet 7.211. We'll also send that out to you and maybe someone can post it into the chat as well. Um, one thing is that last, summer, last winter, um, we tend to, people thought we had a lot of snow. And there is a difference with how much snow we get and the moisture content in the snow. So this is important and, and I'll have a reason for it. So there's a ratio of water in snow. And here in Colorado, we tend to have dry snows. So we can have a total snow accumulation of anywhere from 12 to 20 inches, which then equals one inch of rain. And so this is where people really geek out and you can actually look this up of what the, moisture ratio was in the last snow event we had. Um, so our snow ratios used to be eight to one and now we're tending to be a little bit more dry in a 12 to one. So we need a foot of snow 
to give us an inch of water. So over the course of a month, if we don't have at least 12 inches of snow, depending on how wet it is, that's when it's your signal to get out and try to water. Um, when it's really dry and the air is dry, we could have ratios of 20 to one, so 20 inches of snow to give us one inch of water. Of course, in the fall and in the spring is when we tend to have our heavy wet snows, which is damaging to our trees, uh, but that also gives us really good moisture as well. So just keep that in mind that in the winter, a lot of our snows are very, very dry. And even though we have some snow on the ground, it doesn't necessarily mean that it equals good moisture for our plants. All right, Amy's gonna do vegetables. Right. I was talking to someone earlier, I think it was yesterday, and they mentioned a really good tip with that winter, fall and winter watering is to every time there's a holiday to think about watering your trees. You got Thanksgiving, you got Christmas, you got throwing like President's Day or MLK Day to get to January, um, Valentine's Day, St. Patrick's Day, and Easter. And if you can think about every holiday, celebrate with your trees and get out there and water them. Um, if there's not snow on the ground, that can help you kind of just remember that once a month thing. So a little tip for you, free of charge. All right. So let's get into a little bit of a vegetable garden review for 2021. This was your year, hopefully. Um, and if you didn't have success, that's okay. Um, keep trying. But this was a really good year to um, have success. So um, the picture you're seeing here in front of you um, is taken at Houston Gardens. It's a, a small site owned by the West Blue Conservation District. And they have several of these raised bed planters available for community members to kind of check out um, or rent out, I guess, and grow some of their own vegetables. This is kind of cool. Um, I just want to show this to kind of show an example of a type of raised bed vegetable garden that you can put on your own site. So let's talk a little bit about 2021. As I mentioned, great year for vegetable gardening. What an awesome long tomato year we had, right? So normally, um, a lot of times we'll get questions and calls saying, you know, I got all the way to the end of the year and my tomatoes are still green and it's going to be frosting soon. And because that can happen. Sometimes we get a frost and you know, very early October, sometimes even late September, and your tomatoes are almost ripe. But this year, that growing season is extended. And I bet there are some of you out there who still have tomato plants going um, right now. So that's great. Another great thing about 2021, um, in this picture here, this was taken at Treasure Island Demonstration Garden, you see that they have the shade cloth over the tomato plants. Now that's meant for two reasons, shade and hail. And as far as I know, we didn't have a very significant hail season at all this year either. They did get some a little bit south of Denver in the Castle Rock area. I know some people lost their vegetable gardens early on, but up here in the Northern Front Range, we were really fortunate this year, especially after several years of having some pretty wicked hail storms. So we didn't need that hail cloth, but the shade that it provided um, was still very helpful for those tomato plants. It can help with things like um, sunburn or scorch on the fruits themselves, sunfall, I can think of the word there. Um, early on in the season, we did have kind of a late spring. It was a little too wet and too cold. So that did shorten our season on the front end. Um, most of you that planted in May may have had to start over, um, but that's okay. Just grow some extra plants um, if you're starting from seed and then you've got that insurance um, should we get those uh, late spring frosts. I think we had one almost at the beginning of June this year. So um, good rule of thumb with your tomatoes and a lot of those very tender, warm season loving vegetables is to wait until after Mother's Day. Um, and I have a holiday thing going on here. Um, so wait till after Mother's Day and typically you're safe. Now this year we weren't, but that's okay. Like I said, we were given ample time on the end of the season to catch up. Uh, a couple more pictures just to show you. This is a representation of that late spring. Um, I think this was taken actually in mid-June, and you can see that people's gardens were just getting started um, in mid-June. And then I just love to show pictures of how productive the year was. This is uh, Treasure Island Demonstration Garden, as I mentioned, in Windsor. Uh, you can see that they were successful with just about everything they grew this year, from onions to cabbage to kale squash pumpkins, um, the tomatoes and peppers were fantastic. 
just everything was just a really good year. The squash there, the yellow squash, just looking perfect. And not a lot of disease that I saw this year. Um, it didn't seem to be too wet of a year. And so we weren't seeing a ton of powdery mildew and things like that. Um, insects were definitely there. They were having a favorable year as well. So you may have had to do a little bit more insect control. But um, like I said, overall, just a very high yielding, great year for vegetable gardens. Um, throwing in a little bit from the Larimer County side, this was taken in late August, uh, maybe even early September during our fall twilight gardening series. And this is at Gardens on Spring Creek. I can't remember if I said that or not um, in Fort Collins. And look at their garden also just flourishing. I want to draw your attention to the lower right hand corner. You see a picture of that eggplant down there. Eggplant is one of those that needs a really long growing season. Typically it's 100 to 110 days to get a mature full size eggplant. You can grow some of the smaller novelty varieties um, like Ophelia or some of the Hansel and Gretels that don't take quite as long. But that picture there is a big eggplant. And so again, that late growing season really helps um, to get to that point. So um, good job, vegetable gardeners all across the Northern Front Range. You guys rocked it this year. And to show you that, um, I want to go into a quick report from Grow and Give. Um, just to set this up, if you're not familiar with Grow and Give, this is a program that was started through CSU Extension last year during the pandemic year. We wanted a way, um, we wanted to have a way to connect with people while they were stuck at home and had this huge interest in vegetable gardening that, or and even growing fruit um, that they hadn't had time to maybe work on before. And so we had a big surge in gardening interest. Uh, we also had a huge need at that time and, and still continuing to this day, a huge need to um, provide fresh produce to people that need it, that are having trouble accessing it. Um, and so we created this Grow and Give program. This is a program self-paced. Um, you can get onto our website and learn how to grow your own food, whether it's vegetables or fruit. Um, tons and tons of videos. I can't tell you how many videos and fact sheets and snippets there are for you to learn from. And then it also connects you to those donation centers that are in your area. So you can go on there and work through the interactive map and find a place that accepts fresh produce, hopefully in your hometown. And so uh, free program, you can sign up. It's very self-paced and you can join us next year. So um, in 2021, we actually topped our donation um, pounds from 2020 and we had 54,117 pounds of produce donated um, in the name of Grow and Give to people in need. And so that is just phenomenal. We were really worried in 2020 that what happens when people start getting back to their lives? Are they gonna forget about this program? And we were a little concerned, but no, we were wrong. They, they grew more and they donated more. So that's excellent. Um, because some things weigh more than others, we also like to take into account that, you know, if you're donating lettuce as opposed to a pumpkin, your poundage may not be as much, right? So really that probably the better indicator of how successful the program is, is the total number of donation events. So 1,618 times someone went to someone in need, whether it was a food bank or a neighbor in need or um, a pantry or, or some other place and donated produce, fresh grown home garden produce. And so that's amazing. 1,618 times that that happened. And really it wasn't over the course of the year. It was over the course of the growing season. So, um, you know, from like April until November 1st. So amazing job for those of you that participate in the Grow and Give program. We hope that you'll stick with us, keep doing that next year um, and join us in 2022. So a little bit of county highlights, since we are talking about the Northern Colorado, um, Larimer, Weld County area here. I uh, just wanna give you a little bit of uh, local taste of what happened. Uh, in Weld County, we had 26 participants in the program that donated produce. About half of them were master gardeners. So this is not a master gardener program. This is for anyone and everyone. Uh, we did have one large community garden, that being the Treasure Island garden I mentioned earlier that you can see another picture of here. And we had about 125 times in our county, in Weld County, where people went to that, that donation center. 8,671 pounds came out of Weld County. 
In Larimer County, you guys had 57 participants, a little bit higher on the master gardener side, but that's okay because you guys have more master gardeners. Um, but again, open to everybody. As far as your big, um, bigger community type gardens, uh, the Larimer County Master Gardeners do tomato trials that they donated their um, the product of their research was the tomatoes and they got donated. Uh, Loveland Youth Gardeners, you guys rocked it. I saw your totals, they were really high. And uh, CSU Specialty Crops Program also participated in this and took some of their um, research vegetables and donated them. Uh, overall, Larimer County, I mean, we kind of wiped well out of the water with 305 donation events. So good for you guys. We're coming for you next year. Um, the total pounds donated from Larimer were, were 12,480. So that's over 20% of the statewide total. So you guys should be really proud of yourselves. Um, for what you've done this year for Grow and Give. And it, like I said, it was a great vegetable gardening year. So a lot of this we have to attribute to the weather and stuff. So thanks, Mother Nature. All right, I'm going to turn it back over to Allison. She's going to take us home, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Here we go. You can hang out here. Though. Oh, I know. Okay, we'll hang out here. Yeah. Yeah. We're here to give you advice. Uh, Amy just wrote a great blog on all of the resources available from CSU Extension. And Tony, if you're still on, if you could throw that in the chat, we would appreciate it. But visit our blog, it's csuport.blogspot.com. And it does get updated at least once a week, mostly, sometimes twice. And it's any topic that we feel like writing about. So Amy thought it would be great to share some of those resources. And we are a little bit uh, like, I just blanked on her name, Lucy, oh, yeah, Lucy, Lucy. Uh, Lucy, and we're here for you. So be sure to utilize us. If you're not in Larimer or Weld County, you have an office that can assist you. And of course, Amy and I would be happy to help you as well. So visit us to learn more. And then also coming up in December on the 8th at 1230, we will have our final class for the year on evergreens and holiday decor. So we'll cover some of the common evergreens that you might run into in the landscape and then talk about fun stuff of how you can use those evergreens to decorate your home for the holiday season. Registration is required. Tony, if you could also put that registration link in the chat, you can do that. Otherwise you can find it on the blog and uh, just make sure you join us. So just like you have done all season and supported us with this, we would love to see you in December. And to wrap it up, we oh. will take, oh, I want to talk about this picture real oh, quick before yeah. we go. I No, this way. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I threw this picture in at the end here. We didn't really get a chance to talk about perennials. Um, but I, I just love this picture because it really wraps up 2021 in a nice little package. This was taken in November like a, maybe a week ago, or maybe like a week and a half ago, we had a little tiny bit of snow and the iris are blooming. And I'm like, okay, there's a, a few things wrong with this picture. One, why are the iris blooming in November? Again, it was that long summer we had. Um, some of them just thought that, you know, why not just re-bloom? And then to have it snow on that, I just thought, this is just so odd. I don't know that I'll ever see this, um, or maybe I'll, I'll see it again, but what a weird year um, and a good year. So that's what the picture is there. That was taken at the um, Well County Demonstration Garden at the, at the Extension Office in Greeley at Island Grove. So I just thought that was kind of fun, um, but we're still here. If you guys have any last minute questions, you can throw those into the chat. Um, otherwise, we're gonna do a, a follow-up email for all of you and it will have a copy of the slides for your personal use and lots of links. We'll send you links to those registrations we talked about, a link to the cohorts blog. And then you also have our email addresses so that you can contact us with your personal questions too, should you need to. So. And I think what we all need to remember is that the only thing consistent in Colorado is inconsistent. Yep. And yes, that's what we do. So we would love to answer them. Uh, Tony, you can come on live if you have questions for the Turk dude, you can ask him. Um, but we do thank you for joining us. We hope we see you in December, on December 8th or sometime next year. And thanks for your attention and support of Extension. Yeah, and we'll have the 2022 calendar coming out soon. We've already planned out a monthly class for next year, same style on Zoom. So we'll see you in 2022. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.